So Bob, I have some emails. Let's read them and answer them. What do you say? Yes. So this first email is from anonymous annual patron. She says, in my youth, I often participated in non-suicidal self-injury. It doesn't feel like as high. It doesn't feel like a high as much as a numb, which you mentioned. So in my episode about NSSI or non, by the way, this might trigger people so fast forward about five or 10 minutes. I was talking about how, uh, you know, and I did a whole deep dive on it, but one of the reasons why people will do this is because it uh, can make people, it takes away the pain and it can also give you a certain high. But this person is saying, it doesn't feel like a high as much as it makes me feel numb, which you mentioned a tad, but it seems your focus was more on the high. For, for my experiences, it was much more of a numbness and temporary release, release from my mental struggles. However, I will completely agree it was a way to take my mind off everything, especially, especially the pain. All the pain, real and imaginary, physical and psychological. Having you explain it was validating that I'm not weird to feel this way after self-injury. <clears throat> self-injury seems to help better than any other vices I have tried or partaken now to cope with my biggest issue, my own mind. I know you don't support self-harm at all, but I appreciate the validation there are explanations of why I feel the way that I do after these actions. Having this understanding is something I hope to bring into therapy the next time I go. I haven't told my therapist about my self-harm or how I miss it because of the stigma, but having better understanding, but having a better understanding of why a human brain can react to these actions make me more willing to talk about it and hopefully work through it. Bob, any reactions? I, I'm pretty sure you work with a lot of people who do this. I have, the, yeah. yeah, I have worked with many, yeah. I'm glad that um, you're not doing it. There's it, the 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 risk to premature death is um, um, significantly increased. How so? And so um, because there's the possibility of accidental um, uh, going too far accidentally and then causing death. It is. A, I think it's a dead end way to try to regulate emotion or or numb out from pain. There are um, better things to do than that. So I'm glad. I guess the thing I mean to say here is I'm glad you're not doing it anymore. I don't think there's anything to be ashamed of about it. I've had many, many uh, people in my DBT class have used non-suicidal self-injury to help themselves um, in the way that you're describing. And a lot of them have scars on their bodies as a result. And I say to them, scars, we don't care about, right? Let your freak flag fly. There's nothing to be ashamed of here. It's okay to allow those to be seen. So, you know, wear short sleeves. This is your body. Get used to it. Yeah. Yeah. Agreed. And I feel like, especially among the lay public, there's way too much stigma around this sort of thing. Yeah. It, it's, it's like, what's it like? It's like, um, I don't know. I, I mean, it, so what we, as you were saying, Bob, are hoping is that people who engage in this can find less destructive ways of helping them cope. Yeah. But in the interim, if they have to do this, then, I, you know, if I, if I have a client that, you know, and we're on the track, we're on a road to recovery from the relational traumas that they went through that resulted in, in this ongoing pain, physiological and psychologically that they feel all the time. Uh, and uh, they are continuing to occasionally engage in NSSI. I'm not that concerned. I mean, we might go over the risks. We might talk about, how to stop it other alternatives you know you can use like rubber bands or ice or other um you know just continually talking about the ways but when i hear from clients who are having a hard time stopping i don't i don't really focus on that i'm like well let's continue going down the road of recovery let's talk about emotional regulation um but i'm not going to i'm not going to super i feel like some people particularly like in other industries will like hyper focus on this. I, I would see uh, students in schools, like a student would be discovered having engaged in cutting in the, in the locker room or something and the teachers find out or the administration finds out or, or a kid reports to a teacher that their friend is doing that or something. The whole school would just become completely unhinged and would be like, we got to stop this. We have to stop this kid from doing it because it's not healthy. And I'm just like, whoa, whoa, it's true, but that's not what we should be focusing on. <laughs> you know, it'd be, it's similar to me that 
if someone said they were restricting their diet because they had an eating disorder. Um, you know, there's a concern there, but I don't have any delusion to believe that I'm going to be able to snuff out that behavior by just sort of chastising them or like emphasizing how important it is that they stop, right? There's, there's a long-term path to this right now. And your risk driving the client underground such that they don't even disclose it to you when they do it. So, uh, you know, if we're both on the same page, I have to not like flip out every time and sort of require abstinence from, from this, because it can really be an addiction for people and it's really hard to stop. And, you know, let, let's work on it. And it's not that much of a risk. There's a risk, as you say, Bob, but it's, it's not like the way people treat it is like, oh my God, you're going to, you're going to die the next time you do it. And it's like, well, there's a risk, but it's, it's not very likely. So let's all just relax. Cause if we're going to work with the person, they have to trust us that we're not going to flip out every time it's brought up and like focus on it. You know what I mean, Bob? I do. You're interested in um, what's at the heart of the matter here. The, 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 the behavior itself is fairly superficial in that it's a thing that a person does to cope with painful emotions. So let's address what's causing pain. Let's get to the thing underneath it. Yeah. yeah. Be similar. If someone said that they were drinking to cope at night or smoking right. pot right. Uh, every day, right. I'm, it's not a great thing. It's, Obviously, uh, there's some downsides to it. There's some numbing out and avoidance of emotions. But I'm not going to be like, we have to snuff out that stuff right now before we can move forward. You know, it, it's like, um, it's not going to work. And it's, I find it to be kind of a puritanical yeah. reactivity. Like, right. you're doing something evil and it needs yeah, to yeah. end. It's just yeah, like, no. stop it. it, it, yeah. it's, it it's, it's not it's a manifestation of their pain and relax, pain. like right. just, just relax. It's okay. It's not okay, but the pain is not okay. The symptom of the pain is a symptom of the pain. So, you know, relax. It's, it's going to be okay. Like I can't tell you how many times I'd have to go to schools and just like be a therapist to the administration and just be like, sure, I'm here to, I'm here to fix the problem. Now stop thinking about it. <laughs> like yeah. go home, have dinner with your family don't think about this. I'll take it off your hands. Like, just relax. I got it. And, and the look, you know, well, so in the beginning, what I'd be doing with them is I'd be trying to work with them. I was just like, okay. You know, I'd try to work with their fears about, okay, all right, well, okay, let's, let's really get on this kid and, you know, let's really address it. You know, it's, it's called the parents, you know, it's, it's really focused on this, on this cutting stuff. And then over time, I just learned, you know what the teachers, the admin want, they just want, to not have to think about it because, and why would they, they don't know anything about this sort of thing or very rarely will they? It's scary. So, yeah. And so what they want is for me to tell them, I got this. Know. Don't worry about it. We can hear Colleen in the background. Oh, <laughs> that's okay. Do the thing. No, okay. I just, I just don't know if she's, what she's saying. Is she talking to the dog or I, something? I, I, it's all muffled because of my earphones. Uh, <laughs> I mean, I just don't want her to, accidentally oh, yeah, lead into the podcast without her consent, you know, like if she's saying something private and she's no, you know, our, our dog walkers here. So they're doing the trade. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah. So Omicron, we're podcasting from afar today. So uh, that's so in case we usually Bob is in my office. And so, yeah, but, uh, but yeah, don't worry about it. Bob. Okay. Uh, patron Jay says, she says, is couples therapy a good option for new couples or more of a last resort? I've been dating my partner for almost six months. We are already moving in together, planning our future and consider each other soulmates. Sometimes we have a certain disagreement that causes us both to become triggered and stressed. Should we pursue couples therapy to nip it in the bud or is it more of a last resort for couples? We have both been to extensive individual therapy in our past, but neither of us currently. Bob, what do you think? Yeah, why not? Go to couple therapy, see if it can't help you with the thing. You're just getting triggered, some kind of insecurity, things getting triggered in each of you and you're, you know, sort of just distilling in your conflict. So why not? Why not uh, address it, learn about it? It's going to follow you anyways, so might as well. And not wait till, you know, it's dire. I'd do it. I'd do it now if I were you. Yeah. And 
people do wait till the last resort and that's when the ship has already sailed sometimes yeah. the, the love is gone and yeah. there's no point other than to talk about how to break up ethically so uh there's that the other thing is is that some of the best long-lasting relationships i know about uh, went into therapy couples therapy very quickly so and there's always something to talk about unlike individual therapy couples therapy sessions are always useful i you know with my couples we almost always run out of time you know because there's so much to talk about in a relationship in a marriage you know especially if you have kids patron kelly for florida says can ghosting be traumatizing or cause an attachment injury? I've been dating someone new and there are lots of signs it's going very well. I have been dating someone. However, I constantly find myself worrying about getting ghosted suddenly or that the guy I'm seeing will suddenly lose interest over something irrational or petty about me. I was ghosted by someone I really liked in college and never knew the reason why. This was a very devastating to me at the time and makes me wonder if this is the reason for my distress now. Can being ghosted cause an attachment injury or trauma? If so, what can help? I would love to hear you and Bob discuss this. Bob, what do you think? Yeah, of course it can. Yeah, you were getting attached to somebody, getting close to somebody, and then they disappear. It's kind of like your body experiences that. It's like, kind of like a death. So um, yeah, absolutely. It can have that impact. In fact, you're having a trauma response now. You find yourself worried about... As you become closer to the person you're with now, you become uh, you find yourself getting worried about that same thing happening again. It makes sense. That's like a classic PTSD. I'm not saying you have PTSD, but it's a classic trauma response to something crappy that happened to you, something dip, painful and traumatic that happened to you um, before. So your body's just in fight or flight and you find yourself nervous about it. And then it's a question of, well, what do you want to do with it? And I guess you have choices. You can talk about it in your relationship. Or if that seems premature, like you're just getting to know one another and there's no commitment to one another at this point, or, you know, you could always talk about it in personal counseling with somebody to kind of help yourself regulate your own emotion or um, learn about what is the thing inside you that's driving your terror. Yeah. If you did say something, you might say something like this, if it's, you know, within the first month or so, you could say something like, so I just want to tell you that a long time ago, I was ghosted by someone and it really was devastating to me because one, I thought that we were getting along well. And two, they just never contacted me and they just, and they didn't respond to my texts. And, and I'm guessing that he just wasn't interested, but it really felt bad to me because I just felt like I just, I just wanted some kind of answer, some kind of notification, some kind of explanation. You know, all I wanted was him to call me and just like, Hey, I'm just not into you. I'll, you know, it would have hurt. But the fact that he just never reached out to me, it just really, it felt bad. It felt really bad. I'm telling you this because, um, you know, if anything ever happens with you, which, you know, who knows, I, I just, you know, would love it if you don't do that to me. Um, I'm not saying you will, uh, you know, I don't even know where this is headed. You know, it's only a month, who knows what'll happen, but you know, I, I just, I just want to throw that out there. And, and I want you to know that if that ever happens for me, I'm never going to do that to you. I'll, you know, I'll, I'll tell you up front. You know, you just say something like that. Yeah. Did you ever get ghosted or ghost anyone when you were doing all your online dating? Back yeah, in the day? both, both. How so? It was weird. I, you know, I would do it different if I had to do it over again. But back then, if I wasn't interested in somebody, I just didn't respond to them if they contacted me after a date, say. I mean, this would this would be like if I had a date with somebody and I wasn't interested interested in pursuing it any further, I would ghost. We didn't have the word ghost back then. Now, now if I if I were dating, I would just be, you know, courteous and say, you know, I'm not interested. Or as one person said to me, I don't feel about you the way I want to feel in a relationship, which I thought was the the most elegant letdown I've ever, I've ever experienced. I really liked that. That was cool because it's accurate. And yeah, I've been ghosted. Sucks. I mean, with first dates, it's not that to me after a while, it became not that big a deal. It's like, well, I can read between the lines here. They're not interested in me. And that's fine. Cause you know, plenty of fish and all that. So I would handle it more mindfully than I did back then. Would you back then, did you ghost people 
after like five dates or was no, it usually- no, no. If it was a one date thing, no, if I, if it was, if I met, if I went out with somebody for five dates, I'd speak with them about not wanting to continue. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I feel like it's customary for online dates to be like that, where you, you know, there's a certain rhythm to it and it's really yeah. you know, frequent that it'll follow this course where you match on online you text for a little bit, maybe you call each other, you set up a time, you meet up. It's, you know, either we get a drink or coffee or something. It's short and it's pleasant and you're kind of jazzed up with um, anticipation. Um, you're both kind of looking at each other while you're talking about whether or not you have siblings as to whether or not, could I see myself with this person? Am I attracted to this person? Do they seem like the sort of person that I would like? Do they have any red flags? You know, there's all these things happening. And then you say, oh, let's do this again. And oh, yeah, let's do it again. And you get your car, you go home. And then you get home and you're like, yeah, no. You know, I, I, I don't think that's going to work. Yeah. And then you just don't contact them. Now, if right. they contact you, you're like, oh, there they are contacting me. Uh, what do I do? Uh, I'll just put it off. And then you just never get back to them. And a, a week later, the person's like, I just got ghosted, <laughs> you know, but I think that that's customary. I, I don't know if it's best. Obviously it'd be best if you just sort of texted back a thing, like what you heard, you know, just like, Hey, yeah. I just want to let you know, I just wasn't really feeling it. You seem like a great person. Good luck to, to all your endeavors. Um, but it's so much easier to not, you know, it's so much easier to put it off or to just yeah. ignore and, yeah. and to just hope, well, I hope they get the picture that I'm not, you know, I hope they either think I died or I ghost them. Either way, I just don't want to reply, you know, because <laughs> that's the other thing about ghosting is like, what if something bad happened? You know, what if, what if that, you know, you hit it off with someone. So you go to lunch and it, you really hit it off with someone. You really feel like there was a connection you text them, they don't get back to you. And how are you supposed to know they didn't fall in love with you and then get in a car crash, <laughs> you know, <laughs> like, or they fell in love with you and lost your number or something. I mean, you just, it's a question mark or yeah. they fell in love with you and they're just super busy at work and, and they're, they're definitely going to get back to you in a week yeah. or two. Like, right. it, it's just better just to notify and say like, yeah, you know, it, that's, yeah. It, it's not going to work. I, you know, I'm notifying you so you can focus elsewhere. <laughs> right. Um, but yeah, absolutely. I mean, I'm guessing Kelly from Florida, you might have been traumatized relationally prior to that ghosting back in the day that, you know, re-traumatized you. It's just a, just a guess, but ghosting in and of itself can absolutely, you know, depending on the circumstance, right. If it's first date ghosting, I, I don't know how many people are going to be that, uh, destroyed by that, but you know, maybe some people, um, but if you were say five, 10 dates in and someone just like stops c contacting you, that can be pretty hurtful. It just feels like I'm not even worth reaching out. Now, if you ever are ghosted 99% of the time, the person is ghosting you because they're terrified. They're so afraid. And I, I always emphasize this, that when you are breaking up with someone, you, because it seems like there's the dumper and there's the dumpy, right? But the person dumping is also terrified of rejection, paradoxically. So as they are dumping someone, they're terrified that the dumpy is going to reject them socially. They don't mind about rejecting them romantically because because they actually want the romantic relationship then. But they're also concerned that the dumpy is going to hate them. They're concerned that Dumpy is going to criticize them. And there's good reason to believe that you will as a, as a Dumpy, that you're going to get angry and hurt and you're going to lash out. And so if you don't have differentiation level required, which is most people, you're going to really struggle with taking that leap. And it's going to be so much easier to avoid the whole thing and not contact anyone at all. Because the discourse on the internet around ghosting is like, oh, they're narcissistic gaslighting narcissists. Yeah, right. Um, and instead of, well, yeah, I'm maybe a minority, but the vast majority are good people who are just terrified and, and it's not right, but we understand that people's 
behavior can be driven by irrational fears or unhelpful fears. Um, you know, so the reason why I say that is not to defend the ghosters, but to defend your own narrative of your life. Because if you walk away going, I fell in love with someone who was a complete narcissistic gaslighting narcissist, then um, that's a different story. Then I fell in love with someone. He fell out of love with me and he was too scared given his relational traumas to actually tell me that he didn't want to be with me anymore. I don't feel bad for him because he's a jerk face for ghosting me, but I do, at least it's a different story than I got tricked by a narcissist. You know what I mean? Yeah. Anonymous patron from the UK. She says, what is your opinion about getting therapy from a trainee therapist? I live in the UK where anyone can access therapy for free. However, the waiting lists are long and the therapies offered are generally brief and more CBT oriented. I don't have insurance. Healthcare is free in the UK, so I have never needed extra insurance. Because of this, I would have to pay for my own therapy. I am on a limited budget, so I could only afford to see a trainee therapist who offers discounted rates. I work in the mental health profession myself, and I'm hoping to undertake clinical psychology uh, doctorate clinical psychology training in the future. Although I have been studying and working in the field for a while, I still feel very incompetent. I, I still don't feel competent. I know you have discussed before that this is normal as it usually takes several years to start to feel competent. This makes me question whether a trainee psychotherapist would really be able to help me as they might only have limited experience. I have worked with people in mental in the mental health field who, in my view, have been unintentionally harmful to clients because of their lack of experience. On the other hand, trainee psychotherapists are closely supervised and may also be offered group supervision, which could perhaps mean that I could indirectly get the skills of other therapists. Um, I would love to hear your thoughts on this. Bob, what do you think? Yeah, everything you said makes sense to me. Um, one of the good things about uh, a relatively new therapists is they tend to be very enthusiastic and passionate and want to learn. So you get to benefit from interest and curiosity. Um, and then, you know, there is something to be said for experience, but you know, that comes when that comes. So there's a possibility of being a really mindful client in that you get to talk about your reservations or your wonderings about the experience level of the therapist and what that, the impact of that on you, clearly it's on your mind. Nothing wrong with saying that that's, that that's the case. I suppose a therapist might find that scary, but it is sort of a statement of fact. It's you know, you you see it this way. You have these you have this uh, pers uh, view view of the potential here. So um, certainly, you can stop if you find it not useful, and clearly, if you find it harmful. Though, hopefully, um, you'll be mindful of that as you go and paying attention to that as it unfolds, so that you're not in something that you discover six months later has been you know harmful to you. Sounds like you have sophisticated understanding of how things go and have a good shot to protect yourself properly should you need to. Um, but everybody started somewhere, even Freud started somewhere, and Jung and Yalom and Kirk. Kirk was born a good therapist, so now Kirk's the exception to the rule. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, to piggyback on that, the only thing I'll say is what you're looking for anonymous patron from UK is a good therapist that fits well with you. And uh, the, their trainee status, especially depending on where they are in their training, you know, if it's their first week, then yeah, that's different, but that's different than six months into their internship. Right. Um, you know, their trainee status might have, might be one of the 40 factors that play into whether or not someone is a, a good fit and a good therapist. But you could find someone that's very experienced and be not only a terrible therapist, but a bad match for you. Yeah. And you could find someone that is literally in their first week that has at least enough talent and enough support, supervision, as you're pointing out, to provide you with good therapy. And they just really mesh with you well. So um, is the trainee status a factor? Probably. But it it's not the only factor, <laughs> you know, like I wouldn't really focus on that, especially if you can't afford other, other thing. You know, if you're really constrained by, by money, what I would do is I would just start 
trying five of the trainees and see which one fits with you. So um, now if you're dealing with something really specialized like trauma or dissociation or PTSD, or I don't know, something that's really it requires a, a lot of understanding, then, you know, you, but again, even a seasoned therapist might be terrible at it. So yeah, I, I, given the constraint that you're under, um, I, I would, I would do what you always do, which is just shop around until you find the one that you like. Patron Jennifer from Washington says, are girls and women overdiagnosed with borderline personality disorder? Women and girls are far more likely to be diagnosed with borderline than men. Is this because of sexism in the mental health field? For example, I have spoken with a few women who were misdiagnosed with, with borderline in adolescence and in adulthood have received and corrected diagnosis of an of autism there they went a long time not receiving the right resource, resources for their condition and i imagine their stories are not uncommon autism both presents differently and tends to be highly underdiagnosed in girls and women do you have any thoughts or feedback on this bob what do you think i don't know a whole lot about this but what i heard um, somebody say once a long time ago was that women with borderline personality disorder tend to get funneled into the mental health system and men with borderline personality disorder tend to get funneled into the legal system. I'd say, yeah, we have like a culture wide sort of sexist, misogynistic. I, I don't know. We, we don't look at things equally. We, so yeah, I'd say that we probably are screwing that up where we're yeah. not actually seeing things accurately as, as they truly are. And so therefore people, not just women, but all, um, all people are going to, um, bear the consequence of that. Yeah. Um, in addition to that, I'll say that uh, as with a lot of things, autism included, borderline included, they're both underdiagnosed and overdiagnosed. There's a lot of people with borderline and autism who are mistaken for, for other things or just not even identified as someone who needs an assessment. And there are a lot of people who are identified as having borderline when they don't. And a lot of people who are identified as having autism when they probably don't. I mean, mild autism is kind of a hard thing to parse out sometimes, but so it's kind of both. I would have a hard time understanding how anyone would mistake autism with borderline. I mean, can you imagine that? I do not understand that confusion. I could make a guess, but it's really a guess. It could be like, um, what I've heard some people call, this is not an official diagnosis, quiet borderline personality disorder. Right. So those are folks that don't have problems with emotion dysregulation, but emotion over control. I guess that person might be mistaken as autistic, but even then it seems odd to me that that'd be the case. I'm thinking of somebody I know that had that kind of presentation who was in DBT. And I think actually she was getting the wrong therapy. She was getting therapy for folks who have trouble with emotion dysregulation and she, her problem wasn't dysregulation. It was like over control of her emotions. And so she needed something different that um, she probably could have got if she had done um, RODBT, radically open DBT, um, which is different from, you know, the DBT that everybody sort of familiar with and talks about, um, but worth and, a look. And if, the difference, uh, I remember you talking about this before. For, yeah. If I remember right, it has to do with being extremely honest with your own emotional state or, or with other people, how you're doing, or what was it again? I don't know a whole lot about this. I knew just a little bit. Um, people that are engaged in Radley Open DBT, they do that because they are, they, they, they are like paralyzed and frozen. So part of what they do are, is learning how to read um, facial cues, body language cues, so that they can um, pick up the they can accurately read the environment that they're in, you know, yeah. the other person or whatever. And then they also practice. That, that's part of DBT too, right? N no, it's not actually. Um, well, mentalizing is a part of DBT, right? What's that word mean? Um, reading people's minds and understanding people's emotional states. Oh yeah. yeah they call it validation. Um, it's really different from this. This is like literally like you have a crinkle in your brow right now, right? I could see a little line over your left yeah. Um, and your left eyebrow and your fingers are on your chin right now. And your eyes are a little bit like kind of squinted and yeah. your mouth's open a little. So this is, I can't that racist because I'm Asian. No, I hope not. <laughs> <laughs> now you're smiling. Yeah, I call an Asian a squinty eyed person. Just joking. Anyway, 
Um, so it's much more micro, much more basic. Yeah, yeah. Like so, I'm gonna. I see all that. I take in that data, and from that, um, I can, you know, sort of use that to help me understand what is your likely emotional state, which is probably one of curiosity or interest or um, maybe skepticism. I don't know. Doesn't matter. But I can read that properly as opposed to, oh, Kirk's angry with me because he's got a little crinkle in it, you know, whatever. So there's there's an explicit um, focus. I mean, on- certainly if someone had a deficit like that because of borderline, is that what you're saying? That there's some folks that have this problem of emo- o- emotional over control as opposed to emotion dysregulation. But that, but that they also would have a really hard time understanding the basics of facial yeah. expressions. Yeah. Because of their, because of their borderline. I don't know why that is, to be honest with you. I just know that there are these folks at this presentation that have this trouble in life where they, yeah. they, they believe that, well, I think you probably see it with folks who have trouble with avoidance. They presume that the world hates them or the world, you know, whatever people can't stand them or whatever. And so um, this kind of training could be really useful. And then the other bit of it is um, social experiments where you actually practice interacting in the world. And then you actually talk about in the class, in the DVT class, you talk about what was the experience of doing the experiment with the idea that you want to grow those kinds of experiments so that you can act more spontaneously in the world. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. So what I'll say, Jennifer, is that diagnosing teens is hard Mm. for a lot of reasons. Uh, The two biggest ones are one, a lot of teens aren't super interested in being evaluated. So they're not super compliant and two, you have to ask the client about their inner life and to get at what the diagnosis is. And that's hard to do when you're a teen and you just want to be left alone. So the fact that some teens are being misdiagnosed, you know, that, that happens. Um, the other thing is if someone's mildly autistic, that those are really hard diagnoses to triangulate sometimes because when and I'm not an expert on autism and neither are you, Bob, but Mm-mm. the little bit I understand about it, I'm always like, some of you might notice, or maybe you don't, I actually sometimes don't answer emails about autism because I, I know enough about it to know that I don't know much about it. And when I, I understand moderate to severe autism, because I actually have worked with those people before. And those, I don't understand the genetics and the developments and the brain and stuff, because that's not my area, but I know what it looks like. I know the, the difficulties, I know the symptoms, I know the tendencies and the behaviors, but mild autism is so complex. It's so interesting and it can manifest in so many different ways. I mean, I, I hear people saying almost every time I hear someone with mild autism describing their symptoms, I'm like, oh, I haven't heard that one before. Or I haven't heard that experience. That sounds, that's that's a mild autism thing. Like I've never even heard of that before. So, um, if someone had mild autism in adolescent and also adolescence and also had some kind of uh, behavioral or emotional problem stemming from their experience, you know, of of autism or their even you know their autism itself, and they get mi- misdiagnosed with borderline, like that doesn't really surprise me that much. Um, so there's that. The other thing is, is there's no medication for either one. So it's not like they were misdiagnosed with ADHD and put on ADHD meds and then they had side effects. It's they probably as a clinical team just tried to help, you know, and they, the label didn't really matter as much. Um, emotional regulation, mentalization, those are good for people with borderline. They're good for people with autism. It doesn't, doesn't really matter, you know? And, and so this focus on a diagnosis can sometimes be a little uh, misguided. Now, I don't know, Jennifer, what situation you're talking about. Maybe, you know, really horrible misdiagnoses and mistreatments were happening. I I, I don't know, but you have another question of that. Your main question is, is is there sexism in the mental health field? Yeah. You know, the mental health field is embedded in the United States and a sexist United States. And it has to be sexist just the same way that the record industry, the recording industry is embedded in the United States. It's also sexist, just like the medical field, just like politics, everything, every institution, every, every, you know, section of our society, our military is sex, everything's sexist. So I'm sure the post office has sexism, you know? Uh, so uh, yeah, absolutely. There's sexism and it, it's shown in the data sometimes it's hard to know, but there's some, 
uh, data that suggests that borderline is uh, not associated with gender. And among men and women, people identify men and women, it's 50-50. There's other uh, research that says that among people with BPD, two thirds are women. So which is it? Is it 50% or 67%? Uh, it's a pretty big variance there. Hard to know. What do we define as borderline? Da, da, da. So um, I run on the uh, general assumption that most of the people who men, as Bob was saying, who are borderline are either never diagnosed because they don't seek help in that way, or they're seen as narcissistic or antisocial. Whereas on the other hand, a lot of people who are, a lot of women who are narcissistic, I think are misdiagnosed with borderline. And I've seen this happen before. I've, I've been with clinicians before and I'm, I'm looking at someone and I'm, and what, what I try to do in my assessment is I try to occasionally just think, okay, if this person was a different gender, what would I, how would I see them? You know? And sometimes that can help because it, it's like, oh, I'm, I'm looking at, and actually I do this when I watch 90 day fiance, the, the reality TV show and I'm reacting to it. So, and sometimes I even mention this as I'm reacting, I'll say, okay, if this woman and her behavior w were done by a man, which isn't exactly the same thing, of course, it's a different context, but it just as a thought exercise, what would I think of that person? And sometimes that can illuminate bias because, you know, this behavior, like there's this woman, Angela, who is, uh, you know, she had this behavior, this kind of famous behavior where she was angry for unreasonable reasons <coughs> and smashed a cake in her partner's face. <coughs> Excuse me. And it, at the time, you know, he's a, he's a big fella. He seemed strong and capable physically. He didn't seem physically overpowered at the time. And, you know, but she's a pretty big person pretty imposing physically person, I think. And uh, at the time I thought, okay, what if the genders were reversed here? What if, what if it was a man who was jealous for un unreasonable reasons, uh, an American white man, by the way, in Nigeria and yelling at this, you know, Nigerian woman and for reasons that are completely unreasonable, smashed a cake in her face. What would we say? We'd, we would be um, really uh, I don't know what you say, but um, we would not have good feelings about that. And, and now maybe people don't have that bias. And when they saw Angela do that, it felt horrifying to them. But, but I think that that kind of thing can help. And so sometimes when I'm uh, looking at a client and I've done this for years and I'm trying to conceptualize them, I, I try to think, well, what, what if this was in a, a different gender? What if this behavior was it? What, what would I think about it then? And it, it, can, it can be weird sometimes, you know, there can be times when I'll, I'll instantly see something different, you know, someone will present and I'll be thinking, yeah, maybe it's this. And then I, I, I do that mental exercise. I'm like, whoa, I'm now seeing something completely different. So is there bias in our field regarding personality disorder attribution? hundred percent. And I think there's a fair amount of research to suggest that. Patron Luna from Denmark says, I've been, stars actually, let's take a break. What do you say, Bob? Yeah, let's take a break. All right, we're back from the break. Patron Luna from Denmark says, I've been struggling with forgiving a parent. I feel like it keeps hurting and I am blaming myself for not being able to forgive easier. I'm not sure for whose sake one should forgive. Bob, did you forgive your parents? No. Yeah. <laughs> I'm on a podcast. I'm supposed to say more than that. I'm sorry. In answer to your question, no, I didn't. And the reason for that is because we didn't really have a reckoning. I don't think there could be forgiveness without any kind of apology. And there wasn't. So, no, I'm okay with not forgiving. It doesn't mean I'm walking around with a chip on my shoulder. Occasionally I am, but most of the time not. Um, it means that forgiveness is given when there's been a repair attempt and there wasn't one. My parents are not bad people. My father's passed on, of course. They're not bad people. They're not jerk faces so much, but at the same time, uh, we didn't we didn't do what I believe is necessary to achieve forgiveness. So no. What does it mean to not forgive exactly? 
What do you what do you think patron Luna is even referring to? I'm struggling with forgiving a parent. Like what did, yeah, what does that mean? Is that because um, I think what some people th- mean by that, I don't know if Luna is like sure. seeing them positively or like quote unquote moving on or not being upset about it. Yeah, you, you know, I think you can probably achieve degrees of that if there's been some kind of reckoning. But I don't think that just like, oh, I'm going to, I've been wronged and I'm going to forgive, you know, is like, if, I don't think it's in our interest to walk around with a grudge and a chip on our shoulder. If we are angry, then so be it. Um, we probably want to address that, but not because if we're supposed to be something, this is all my opinion, we're not supposed to be something for somebody else, but because as they say, resentment is like taking poison and hoping the other guy dies. So probably in Luna's interest, in my interest to not walk around with, you know, bitterness or um, grudge. But if I have bitterness in me or grudge in me, or if I have unresolved anger, it's in my interest to pay attention to that, to address it, to address it in a way that I think is, is compassionate um, and understanding, because it's really just a marker for a, a wound that hasn't healed. So, okay, fine. How is that showing up in my life these days? What do I want to do when I have interactions with the person that hurt me? I want to be pretty mindful about that. There are some things that you can do um, to work with repair that don't have anything, not repair, work with resolution that don't have anything to do with the other person. So there's that um, emotionally focused individual therapy. Have you heard of this? Essentially, it's the holodeck. At, on the enterprise. I think I talked about that before. So, um, but that meaning, doesn't meaning change. What? what is it? It's like, it's like, if I, let's say I have um, bitterness towards my dad, it would be like similar to that gestalt thing though, as my teacher said, yeah, without all the furniture rearranging, but having a conversation with my dad about what happened and it's an imaginal conversation. So my dad is there imaginally and the therapist is there guiding me. Okay. So what does dad say when you say this? And I listen and I repeat, I report what dad says and okay. So how do you want to respond to that and have a conversation that can be transformative, but sometimes people do that. And what they'll run into against is a recalcitrant parent who like in this case, doesn't want to acknowledge it remains closed, remains guarded, remains uh, defensive and so be it. And the point isn't to try to get that to move. The point is, is that if that's the case, if that's the inner world that I'm inhabiting, then it's to work with that. Okay. Yeah. So I have this um, interject that is, remains defensive, remains, um, you know, um, whatever. And how do I want to be with that? Because what it probably means is something like, well, I'm going to want to limit my contact with that. Cause it's sort of like, well, um, don't go where it's toxic. Have you done that work, that empty chair in your head work? No. I have uh, with clients, and one of my most formative moments as a therapist happened early in my career where I just, I did that with a client with his dad. And he did, you know, I had him go to that place in his mind. And he had an explosive emotional moment that was uh intense and later on he would say it was like this huge turning point for him right on um because he was this really nice um, guy father construction worker you know, hard worker and was chronically like stressed and angry but but not at anyone in particular he just felt on edge, you know? Yeah. And yeah, it was a, it was a really, um, I I think about that every once in a while. Sounds powerful. Yeah. And it's just kind of amazes me how, I don't know how, um, what do I say? How free I was as a therapist back then, even though I had no idea what I was doing. Mm. (laughs) Because that would have been like, yeah, right in the beginning, I'm, I'm just thinking, man, like you had some um, some risk taking that I don't mm-hmm. know if would be justified. <laughs> but, but anyway, uh, yeah, it's interesting thing about you know forgiveness. Mm-hmm. Like when you say, Bob, I do not forgive. Is that saying I'm not letting them off the hook? Mm-hmm. Is that is that that 
the central feature of the I will not forgive part that you're saying? Yeah, this remains here between it. Whether we talk about it or not, this is here. And I'm not pretending that it isn't. But the opposite doesn't make any sense either, because if you know they had come to you and said, I'm sorry, and they were sufficient in their way of an apology, and you mm-hmm. quote unquote forgave them, it still doesn't deny that it happened. No. So I, I don't know what it means, you know, forgiveness in that. What, what do you think it means? I, I don't know. I'm going to say that right now, what I think it means is that there's the potential for a kind of openness in the relationship as acknowledgement of the wound. Like, so that, like, an, like an invitation to ongoing recognition Yeah, that like, I did something wrong to you. Right. This is now like in, it's on the record. We both agree. I did something wrong to you and it's open for discussion. Yeah. And as it, as it comes around again and again and again, there's room in this relationship for us to process that and a recognition that there is a desire for both people for there to be healing. And at what point do you quote unquote, forgive them? Is it the beginning of that process or middle or end or what, what happens Maybe it's all of it. Maybe it's at the beginning, but it's also in the middle and at the end. Maybe that's not a one and done kind of thing. Maybe it's, you know, are you sorry? Yeah, you know what? I'm sorry. Even though I've said I'm sorry 900 times before, maybe. Like if I was that lucky to have somebody that were that kind of humble. Maybe forgiveness is really about um, being willing to take a risk and put my eggs back in the basket. As the victim, so to As speak. As the person who got hurt, yeah. yeah. Um, if Colleen had, in the middle of a minor fight, said something hurtful, and then the next day said, I'm sorry for saying that hurtful thing, and you forgive her, what does that mean? Well, the level, maybe it depends on the level of the offense, right? Like, maybe there are some things where if she said something, you know, because everybody does, we all say, I have, she has said these things that are, you know, kind of mean and... um and they begin and end then. They begin and end with the thing being said and then the thing being repaired and it doesn't live on. It doesn't have a life beyond that. And, 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 and if you hadn't forgiven, like she hadn't, she did the hurtful thing. The next day, she, she doesn't say anything. And do you forgive her in your mind or what happens there? I suppose that the question, the question is, is, what do I need? Do I need acknowledgement of this pain? If I do, great. If I don't, you know, fine. I don't think that we have to address every little wound. Like some wounds, we can just like heal ourselves and we're good, right? And some wounds, if we can't, then maybe we owe our partner or ourselves, if we're going to have an intimate connection, um, the courage to speak about it. Say, you know what? I, I don't necessarily wish it was this way, but I'm really bothered by what you said the other day. And it's been on my mind rattling around and I, I want to talk about it. Yeah. Oh yeah. You want to talk about it? What's up? Well, you know, it hurts. And for some reason I can't seem to like, let it go. Like I'm wondering if you're walking around and this is the view you have of me. Is that the view you have of me? No. Or, well, yeah, sometimes. Oh. And what I do with that depends on, you know, like if she says no and like, okay, well, what made you say it? Now I was just really, really, really mad. And I went for the jugular and you know, whatever. Or yeah, sometimes I do look at you and I think that that's the case. Oh, that's embarrassing. What's, what's the deal with that? And I don't know what we do if that were the case. I can't say I'm pointing at any particular moment like that, but if there was, then there would be a possibility of us working with it. Cause the, the point of it isn't like, I don't really know what forgiveness either is either, but maybe it's that maybe it's just this like potential to visit pain when it, when it shows up a willingness and commitment on both of our parts to address it honestly um, sincerely. That's a tall order though. You know, like yeah. for most people that never happens ever. It's not. Yeah. It's so, not. so I think that, yeah, it's interesting to think about forgiveness. Think about like, what's the opposite of forgiveness. That's another thing to think about. Like, yeah. If, if we kind of define forgiveness as a variety of things, what's the, what's the opposite? I, I think that some people mean it to mean that I'm holding a torch for m- m- what you did. Like I, I'm, I'm never forgetting, you know, I, I am purposely putting energy and to remembering what you did to me mm-hmm. and to forgive you is for me to no longer do that, to 
not think about, not actively remind myself of what you did to me or something like that. You know what I mean? I don't think we get say over it. I think if I'm holding a torch, then I'm holding a torch. Right. If I'm actively thinking about it, then I'm actively thinking about but it. But I think some people do, right? If you do have a choice, meaning that it's not at the level of a relational trauma that okay. is sure. kind of stuck in your bones. Right. Um, I think some people can actively hold on to things that they have volitional control over and their forgiveness is that, as saying, okay, I'm going to stop. You know, it's sort of like your yeah. your partner uh, obsessively hurtful and the next couple of days you're just like i can't believe she said that i can't believe yeah. that's like complete bullshit and then a certain day you're just like eh, you know what I- i've probably said horrible things too she 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 was probably just upset at the time i'm yeah. gonna forgive her in my mind i even though she didn't apologize i i, I i'm just gonna let go let it go yeah that's but cool i think that's another element of forgiveness yeah, I, if he can if he can do that, great. If he can't do it, then well, you're either gonna have to figure out. Well, you don't have to do anything. You're gonna either carry a grudge, you're gonna try to find a way to let it go, or you have the possibility of addressing it with your partner sincerely and honestly. That the point here isn't to you know rake them over the coals, but to work towards you know some kind of resolution. I don't think forgiveness means forgetting. Like when I think about my dad and the one moment that we had that was sort of in the direction of forgiveness, he asked me once, are we all right? But he never said he was sorry. And so I responded in a rather vague way. And I said, I'm still mad sometimes. What would it take for you to forgive your dad given that you have to say he was sorry. So he's, he's no longer with us. So it's it's never going to happen. It's not going to happen. Not in real life. No. Yeah. I could do a hologram with him. I never have done that. I, well, I suppose if you found a note that he had written, like a journal entry, and he said he was sorry, like that would provide an opportunity for that. That would be quite a surprise. Yeah. 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 It's interesting to think about. You know, of course, we have to think about Christianity and forgiveness. It's a central tenet to Jesus Christ and the, the meaning of that whole thing. And mm-hmm. I think that forgiveness within that philosophy is releasing someone from the ongoing punishment that the that god or the universe will uh, do to you if if you did something wrong forgiveness is to say i wash away your sin Mm -hmm. Uh, your sin is no longer attached to you i forgive you and thus release you from the negative consequences that god will give to you i i don't think i've ever put that in a word is that an Mm -hmm. accurate kind of semi-accurate way of describing the Jesus Christ forgiveness thing. I heard John Gottman say once that all religions have that in common. They all have a way to wipe the slate clean when there's been sin. There's a recognition that people screw up and there's a means by which they can get right. Right. That that Christianity, Judaism, all the religions, they all have this in common, this um, function. Why do you think that is? Because humans need it because we make mistakes. And, and it is not useful for us to walk around beating the crap out of ourselves or believing that we are, you know, bad or wrong or doomed. So we need a way out. Yeah. But, but religions are social institutions. Oh boy. Oh, that's a big one. And so the social institution is providing a means by which you can recover from shame. Yeah. Right. I think that's, I sometimes marvel at Christianity's central tenet of forgiveness and you know Jesus Christ dies on the cross for your sins, present, past, future, mm. so that you can get into heaven. And as long as you are uh, sorry and ask for forgiveness, God will provide it because Jesus died for your sins. You know, Jesus made that's the whole thing, right? And it's a powerful message. You know, when you think about it in the in light of shame and how you could argue shame is the driving force of every negative psychological behavioral thing among humans. You know, the, the shame and the denial and the, the anger and the lashing out and the isolation and the blame, you know, everything that emerges from the shame of like, I am not a good enough person or Mm -hmm. I'm treated as if I'm not a good enough person Mm -hmm. and how to offer forgiveness for everything it really does feel good to think about that if there were 
a supernatural power that just knew you and knew everything that you had done. And you just said to that supernatural power, I, I, I know I've done all these things and I'm so sorry. Can you, do you forgive me? You know, and God or Jesus just said, yes, a hundred percent. I, I, I'm God. I know you did those things. And those things were bad. Those things were even against me, but I promised to love you and to forgive you. Like that's a powerful feeling. I think as a social institution, a response to the psychological need that perhaps has been around for a long time, especially as we live in more societies where you don't know if people are on your side. You know, I, I'm guessing if you were in a tribe of 50 people, you would just kind of know experientially, oh, that, you know, yeah, I screwed up two years ago with that person, but they've proven to be ever since then that they're on my side. I don't, we don't necessarily need to talk about what happened. I, I can bank on that. But when societies, we barely have contact with, a, with our best people. <laughs> you, can, you can have a best friend or, you know, you can be married to your soulmate and see them really intimately like 13 minutes out of the day, <laughs> you know, and that's just not the way things used to be. And so this idea of like, you're okay. Well, you know, that whole Christianity, it could be argued. Its whole purpose is to tell people you're okay. And on one hand, you could say, well, that wrongly vind or releases people from uh, being responsible. But I would argue that uh, perhaps, but I think more importantly, a lot of our bad behavior in the future is due to the fact in the present, we can't forgive ourselves. We can't think of ourselves as, as good people who made a mistake. We think of ourselves as like bad people who did mm -hmm. something bad. Right. And how psychologically helpful and sociologically and politically helpful it is. If people can just say, people care about me. They like me for who I am. I'm a good enough person. I've made mistakes. I, I didn't mean to. Um, and at least someone understands that, you know, I, I can bank on that, that I'm a good person who's, who's, you know, had a few gaffes or even just some, I was misled or I had an emotional, uh, you know, outburst and I just didn't mean to, um, like today I was in the doctor's office and I, I had never met this doctor and he walks in and he said, welcome. Cause it's my first time to the clinic. And I said, and I said, welcome to him back. <laughs> So if there's a Jesus, please forgive me for saying such a stupid thing to my doctor today. Doctor's I'm so office. Embarrassed. <laughs> you ever do that? You know, like oh yeah, you're at the movies and they're like, um, "All right, enjoy your movie." And you're like, "Hey, you too." And you walk away. Yeah. And you think, that was why did I like? It's, yeah, just, right. it's not it's what like, you say. I'm on it's, autopilot here. It's not what you say in that situation. Uh -huh. um, all right, one more email. Famous patron Natasha from California, she says, I know you've talked about it in the past, but how useful or important would you say it is for aspiring clinicians to major in psychology for undergrad? My major is currently in electrical engineering, but I've been thinking lately that although I enjoy being an electrician, I want to do something more meaningful to me at some point. Did you ever wish in grad school that you had more knowledge in the field or did it matter that much? At this point, I feel like I'd only be using an engineering degree as a fail safe, but it seems like a lot of effort for something I don't actually want to be doing long term. Would you say your students that enter grad school with a background in the field have a better overall understanding? Are they more likely to be accepted into a program in the first place? Bob, what do you think? Not sure about that second one. That first one, no, I don't think they have a better understanding. Psychology, de bachelor's psychology degree is a pretty, it's unremarkable in terms of um, how it prepares you to be a clinician. So if you like electrical engineering, stick with it. That's great. You're probably going to have to do some prereqs to get yourself into graduate school. But I don't think that it has even the slightest impact. Like Kirk and my bachelor's degrees, mine's in psychology, yours is in business. But yeah. we're both what we are. We're both good therapists. And yeah. I don't think it has any bearing. Right. Bachelor's degrees in psychology have to do with like psych 101 stuff, yeah. which is uh, research and rats research. and behaviorism. Yeah. And, the and, history of psychology. And, yeah. So, uh, and to take a class bachelor level that is core or central to a psychotherapy degree is actually kind of hard and maybe 
like impossible in some institutions. They exist. Yeah. Well, they do like at Antioch, we would have what we call ladder students who would take um, even some of our master's level classes as bachelor level people, but that was kind of specific to our institution. Anyway, mm. generally speaking, and I have trained hundreds of people and I've also looked at hundreds, thousands of applications. And I'll say that the vast majority of people did not have degrees in the field. Um, bachelor's degrees in the field. Um, also, I'll tell you from just my personal experience and those around me seemingly did not favor those who had psychology degrees. The one thing that I think it does help is that w when you start writing, because, you know, so yeah. one thing you definitely need to be good at is writing in yeah. a master's program. And two, if you know how to write in psychology ways, then that also helps. Because I, I mm -hmm. have seen some students who come to my program who have been writing in psychology in their bachelor's degree, and they are really ahead of the other students. Now, the other students catch up by, you know, quarter, two or three. So it's not like it's a disaster. Um, the other thing, Natasha, that I can relate to you is that at the beginning of my bachelor's degree, I was planning to become an engineer and I, I was taking chemistry and physics and math and whatnot. And that was where, that's actually where my strengths are. Um, humanities, I'm not so good at English and history and writing. I'm, I, especially back then was really, really bad. I, I was not a good writer, not a good reader, not a good sort of understander of all those humanity squishy topics, language. But when it came to chemistry and physics and math, like I was a it was easy to me. Like I aced, I got four O at my first quarter at U, at UW in the pre-engineering program. And, um, and I didn't even work that. I mean, I worked hard, but like you, Natasha, I was like, I don't want to do this. Like I, I, I can do it. And it, it's, it's where my uh, strengths lie. And a lot of other people seemingly want me to do this thing. And they seem to believe this is a good career, but I just, I know what the job entails, and I'm just not interested in it. It's just sitting at a desk and working in uh, some computer program and, you know, designing some kind of thing or testing some number here. I, I, it just doesn't interest me, you know? Um, so, and, you know, that's just me. Of course, there are engineers out there who love their, that they that they do their job. You know, like Todd, he's an engineer, right? He, he likes what he does. Right? Now you're saying, you know, is it worth it? Well, you need to get a bachelor's degree. So uh, from what you're saying, there's like, two, there's two options. You kind of stick it out with your electrical engineering degree, and then you sort of have that under your belt. And, you know, maybe you take a, a gig as a electrical engineer and you, a part-time gig, and you can actually get paid a lot. To, so you don't have to go into debt while you're in grad school. You know, there's some people that will do that. Yeah. Um, so there's that option, or you jump ship and you get a bachelor's degree in something else that is maybe easier or something, but you'd really have to weigh the pros and the cons of that, you know, to have a bachelor's degree in electrical engineering, if, if you're like almost to the end, you know, it might be kind of good to have that credential, who knows, you know, maybe you'll become a therapist. That's just really good at like designing computers for therapists or something. I don't know. Like, <laughs> uh, you know, cause like for me, I didn't know I wanted to be a therapist when I was in my bachelor's degree, but I'm really, I, and, and I got a business degree cause I didn't know what else to get, but I knew that I wanted a bachelor's degree that would have some usefulness and it has, you know, I, I studied accounting and finance and economics and, and, you know, it's bachelor's level. So it's not very in depth, but I, I think, you know, I think it helped me a little bit. So there's that. Um, but contrary to what Bob's saying, I, I, I will say that people who have under who have a background, um, do have a little bit of a leg up, but Natasha, you've been listening to this podcast for years. So you, uh, if you go to graduate school and, and, and for, if you go with therapists, I'm going to take a guess and say that you're going to be like running circles around people, Natasha, the things that you know from this podcast, you, you probably know more about some things than your professors will know, honestly. I mean, not to toot my own horn, but the amount of yammering that I've done about all <laughs> sorts of stuff and Bob, Bob as well. Mm. And the fact that you've listened to it, yeah. you know, for so many years now, Natasha, um, there's no bachelor's degree that could compare to that, to that knowledge base, you know? So if you're worried about being like, uh, uh, sort of 
not a good student, I would, I would be, you know, and I'd be curious. And some people have written in about this, but I'm, I'm curious specifically though, did people, for those of you who listened to this podcast for a long time before you started grad school, did you feel like, wow, I know a lot of stuff from that dumb podcast I listened to. Like, um, you know, they're, the professor is going over stuff that I learned years ago and the professor is only talking about it in this really brief way because we only have so much time and I'm light years ahead of my student, my fellow classmates on this topic. Now, of course, I'm not saying this podcast replace a master's degree because there's a, you know, I'm guessing 90% of the things that are covered in a master's degree. I never, I never get to, I never talk about, but um, yeah. So that's what I'll say about that. Right on. <laughs> yeah. Uh, The last thing I'll say is the vast majority of students who enter my program, which is, you know, pretty typical population slice are completely ignorant about all things related to psychotherapy. So the idea that you're supposed to be somehow knowledgeable, and I always expect that, you know, I always, I always just, you know, and occasionally I'll have a student that knows a little bit more and I'm always like, Oh, you know, a little bit, but I always just default to these people are just dragged in off the street and they know nothing about nothing. And that's fine. That's good. You know, it's, you're in graduate school, you're here to learn. And I, 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 why would I expect you to know anything about anything at this? You're you're in grad school. It's fine. So I think that a lot of programs are kind of like that, but anyway, I bet that's true. All right, Bob. So that does it for that. Um, There were more emails, of course, but, um, but uh, you know, I feel like we did okay. Right. We did all right. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So everyone out there, um, do what you want to do with your career and take care of yourself because you deserve it.